Hey, you're just in time for Ham Nation. We've got a great show for you tonight. We're going to talk about health and welfare nets that are springing up around. We're also going to have another club spotlight and we're going to get a little taste of the pine board. Yeah, that's all coming up right here, right now with you and me and Amanda and Dr. Bob and a whole bunch of other people on Ham Nation. Ham Nation is brought to you from LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees? LastPass can ensure that they are by making access and authentication seamless, whether they're working in the office or remote. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your station, plus the fastest shipping in the industry. In-stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash hamnation. By ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation. And by FreshBooks. Are you struggling to choose the right accounting software for your business? Let FreshBooks help. The number one accounting software in the cloud for self-employed professionals and their teams. Try it free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash ham nation. This is Ham Nation, episode number 450 for April 22nd, 2020. Health and Welfare Nets. Hello, everyone. I'm Bob Heil, K9EID, and you are tuned to Ham Nation. This is a show about ham radio and all kinds of things around it. But recently, we have a little bit different twist in that we're trying to help people communicate better and, and, and learn more about what in the world is going on in this crazy world that we have. But uh, I've been doing things. Uh, uh, we've been talking about my antenna system here. I'll show you what I did yesterday. This is kind of funky. I didn't upload it. There's, uh, there's one of my neighbor friends. Come on here and focus up, buddy. We shot a, a line up in a 75-foot tree there behind oh, him. Oh, wow. Yeah, he it went way over. He he had that thing. <laughs> he had that pumped up at ninety pounds, and it's boom. Oh my gosh! Next stayed over, huh? Yeah, but we wanted to get over that seventy-five foot tree. So now I have a big a big tree and a rope, and I've got some other things coming that we can put on the other ends. So that uh, uh, that's my good buddy uh, Mike. WA9MW, he's just up the road. But uh, that's what Ham Radio is all about. We help each other, we have fun with each other, and oh boy. Well, tonight we're going to have a very special night, as all of them are, but we have not one, but we have two guests on from two different clubs. First of all, we got to make sure that Gordon is good in Costa Mesa. How you, how you doing in Costa Mesa? I'm, I'm doing great. And you know, the best part of this being sequestered at home is being able to talk to more hams than I've ever talked to in a long time. And uh, so there is some merit to uh, staying at home. And let me tell you, new ham James Sutherland, KN6IPL, had been studying and studying to get his license. He was a member of the GOTA Amateur Radio Club, GOTA.com. And he says, I want to take my test. Well, um, they made it happen. Thanks to hamstudy.org, Richard Bateman, and Larry, who is the VEC of the W5YI VEC, they conducted a remote exam. Richard, KD7BCC, was the contact VE. Ken, KC6WOK, the uh, GOTA uh, club uh, president. They made it happen. He passed the test with flying colors via remote. He knew more about setting up the computer than maybe mom and dad, although mom, KE6RXX is a ham and dad, AC6 
Foxtrot Juliet upgraded to extra. So let me tell you, there is merit in remote testing. And we really thank the W5YI for the California's, actually one of the first, or make that the first youngest. So we'll say not necessarily the first. Larry did a couple of tests in the uh, Utah area, um, or actually Utah, uh, watching someone in California take a test. But he is the youngest ham so far to pass remotely. How about that, huh? Back to you, That's Bob. Great. But look what's behind him. Leave that picture up. He's got a turntable and some speakers and it looks like maybe <laughs> a CD machine. Is that not right? Yeah. Got an amplifier. Yay. I love it. <clears throat> That's what I've been doing all day. I've been <clears throat> listening to uh, a, lot, a lot of these things. Uh, you remember those, don't you, Gordo? Um, yes, uh, Radio Shack got me started with cassettes for our code course. There, there's only one one situation. I haven't lost them yet. I, I just bought a brand new machine. Here's an Aero Garner and Misty, if you'd like to hear that. <laughs> I have hundreds of them. And I have a lot of them. When I was on KMOX those 25 years, we have some of the programs and all of that kind of stuff. Still listening to that. I know the chat room's going, that guy's crazy. Nobody listens to that. Well, I got news for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my oh my oh my i told you we have fun well uh what we want to do is bring in our our guests tonight first we're uh, uh valerie is going to be here with a very special guest and a really life-saving cement life-saving information this is really something she's worked to get this going so she'll be here with andy don's got of course, good news line uh, stuff. So you want to stick around. Uh, George took a, a vacation tonight. Uh, so no George, but I'm going to fill in on the smoke and solder just for a couple of minutes. I got some words. But I think what we ought to do is kick it off with uh, the clubs. Ed is here with us. And uh, let's see what's going on in Ed's club. WX2R. Ed, how you doing, buddy? Thanks for having me on. So, um, you know, th this, you know, what we wanted to talk a little bit about tonight is really what I think is the first health and welfare net uh, that was started in the country by our club, the Fairlawn wow. Amateur Radio Club, which is located just outside of New York City. Uh, we started the net on March 13th. Um, this, Bergen County, which is located just outside of New York City, uh, has had one of the highest incidents of the virus. Uh, of any county in in the country, um, as of the, uh, yesterday, uh, they were about thirteen thousand cases uh, inside Bergen County, with about eight hundred deaths. Uh, and so we've been locked down very, very quickly. Uh, yeah. We're a, we're a town sponsored club. We're one hundred and sixty members. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have our own clubhouse with five operating stations. Uh, W2MPT is our call sign. And on the, you know, on the week before the 13th, we were locked down and the town locked us out of the clubhouse. You know, and the following week was the first week in really about 60 years that you know, we didn't have a meeting. And there were four guys on our repeater, uh, KD2MOB, KC2K, WO2W, and KC2TBD, who were on the net and uh, just sort of said, you know what, we should do this every night to keep members in touch with each other. And they reached out to the board. Uh, I'm one of the trustees. Uh, and we quickly established what we call the Health and Welfare Net, which supplements our near and far net on Monday nights. We meet every night at seven o'clock. Um, we started with four people again on that first night of March 13th. Uh, the second night went to six. The third night went to 10. Uh, we now average over 20. 20. Uh, at oh. our peak, we've had over yeah. 35 people check in. The net is an hour. It's fast paced. It's really designed uh, just sort of, you know, to let us, let people know uh, that you're OK. Uh, and it also it, it acts as both a physical and both a, and, a, and a mental uh, sort of health uh, net in terms of just, you know, who have you heard from? Uh, what's going on with grocery shopping tonight? We talked a little bit about going to the pharmacy and some of the travails here in North Jersey of doing that, uh, how to get a haircut, who are the stations that you work and some of the projects that you're working on in isolation. So, uh, you know, again, like as, as most clubs too, I mean, we, we realized very early on is that, 
you know, we've got, you know, I guess, a lot of people who are not who are sort of in that key group in terms of being at risk. We have 60 percent of our members who are over the age of 60 plus. Uh, and so we decided that it was really important for us uh, to really keep in contact with people on a, on a regular basis. And that was the start you know, for what we wanted to do. So, um, yeah, you know, I guess you know, the other thing that we're that we're doing here now as well is that in the last couple of days, since the net has now been up for 40 nights, uh, again, which is a really long running net, you know, just in terms of things that are going on, is that we realize that there's some people who we haven't heard from. And at the same time, too, that there are a number of people who were on the net early on who we haven't heard from, which obviously causes us some concern. So what we've done is just sort of go through our roster. Again, we're about 160 members, so it's not a short list. And there's a long tail of people that you don't necessarily hear from all the time. Uh, and just you know, do that outreach to say, you know, have you heard from this person? And let's divide the list up and try to, get in, try to get in contact with everyone. Uh, so that we can sort of follow up with those people on a regular right. basis. So that's really what we're doing here. You know, and again, you know, it's it's something that, uh, you know, we know from the value of our membership that networking is the most important. And obviously, you know, we wanted to say that even though you're being isolated right now is that you're not alone and that the club is here to help you. And that's the reason for why we're doing this on a nightly basis. So back to you guys. The thing about amateur radio is uh, we can talk anywhere in the world and yeah. it's becoming very, very positive about the, the, the nets. And, you know, you used to have a, a net every week or some had every month. Now, like you say, they're every night just to yeah. check on everybody to make sure you're still OK. Do you need help and that kind yep. of thing? So Yeah, and, and, and that's that's really a good point, Bob. I mean, you know, simply because, I mean, we've got we've got a number of guys uh, who have offered to help. You know, help with shopping, you know, help with errands, those types of things for some people uh, who either have physical handicaps uh, or just can't get out of the house, you know, those types of things. So that I think that's, you know, the really nice thing. The thing that's also amazed us is just as sort of as words got around about the net is that we've had not, you know, not only local check ins, but we've had people check in from uh, southern New Jersey, from New York State, from Pennsylvania, from Florida and from Puerto Rico as well, just to sort of check in, extend their goodwill. You know, and also strike up a conversation because, in a sense, they're lonely and isolated at the same time, too. Right. So that's what we do as hams. And I think that's some of the value that we're, you know, we've tried to create here you know, with the Absolutely. near and far. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, let's um, run through a few things here. Uh, uh, you brought some great pictures to me. So here we are. There's your logo. That's us, and, yeah. Uh, 1956, huh? Yeah. Wow. That's the year I was licensed. But uh, yeah. Yeah, it, and, and we've met continuously, you know, you know, for, you know, well, since, you know, last Friday in person, or two Fridays ago in person. So, um, but there you go. Well, it's it's wonderful that we can share on all this. Tell us what's going yeah, on we, there. You know, we do, you know, we do, mo we, we do monthly programs, uh, and we did them, we've done them now for nearly six years. Uh, and that's one of the gaps that we've talked about uh, as late as this, you know, as this afternoon, simply because obviously uh, we haven't been able to do a program. Uh, for the month of March, but we've decided that we're going to use the technology as you're using here tonight. Uh, we're going to put on, use our own members in terms of creating our own programs on a monthly basis, uh, yeah. and you know, and obviously just to reconnect people. Actually, you you can if you just go to YouTube and uh, you know take a look at the Fairlawn Amateur Radio Club, uh, our entire series of YouTube uh, videos is available. That's our club for field day uh, last year. Okay, just part of the group. This was our setup crew in the morning. Uh, and the park that we use for field day is actually right behind this house. So it's a short walk for me. <laughs> oh, that's, that's cool. Yeah, yeah make sure I'm, the, I'm the closest physically, which is a nice thing. So. <laughs> make a short walk. Uh, yeah, I that's, think that's an easy walk, right? Yeah, a short walk. I liked it. <laughs> well, that's great. And you notice we all wear red, okay? We, we yeah. Try, we tried to do the brands. Yeah, this is what we do. We do a portable day. Uh, with with the with the Bergen Amateur Radio Club, which is sort of our sister club, uh, about half of our members you know belong to each other, uh, and that's one of the things that we do. We get together twice a year and just do a portable outing. I will mention as well too, just as as a, as a sidebar too, because we talked a little bit about um, you know sort of really what's going on in terms of the incidence of the virus in the county. Two members of our club, from what we know, have con have contracted it or contacted it. Uh, they both have recovered. Uh, we do have one member, however, who's lost his mother uh, to you know to the disease uh, probably about two or three weeks ago. So uh, we have not been immune, and actually, a member of our, one of our nearby clubs also has lost a member. Uh, we do a lot of outreach. Uh, this is something that we did. Uh, there is a uh, 
a house here in Fairlawn uh, that's over 300 years old. And we did a special commemoration day, and that's Larry, W-A-2-A-L-Y, who's the sort of Morse code expert, and he's helping kids uh, get on the air and, you know, type out their name in Morse code, and they love Terrific. it, and he really loves it, so as well. Terrific. Too. We, do, we do a lot of community service. We do two special event stations. Actually, we had one scheduled today with the National Park Service. Uh, at Patterson Great Falls, that obviously had to be canceled. Uh, we do a community outreach day for their education program. These are a couple of our guys, uh, you know, just sort of, you know, just sort of around Portable Day, um, and you know, you know it, it's a good group, okay. And obviously, uh, we like each other a lot, and it's a part of the networking that keeps us all together. So, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, we know uh, this is a new. Uh, we've got, as we mentioned, we've got uh, a clubhouse. Uh, that the town has graciously donated the space for the last 60 years or so. Five, five operating positions. We put two anten We put new antennas on the roof uh, last year, and we've added two flex radios uh, to the station uh, uh, inventory, you know, as well too. And that's Fred W2AAB, uh, who's operating one of the flexes there. So uh, big concert. Great. And there's yeah. that. This is our newsletter. Who's yeah, this is our newsletter. Uh, we don't do it. It's it's sort of a mini magazine. It averages about 50 pages. Yeah. Uh, on a monthly basis, fifty pages. I'll I'll be glad to send one to anyone to anyone who's interested. Wx2r at arrl dot net, uh, and I'll send you a copy. Uh, this it's it's not. Uh, I'm an old newspaper guy. It's not boilerplate copy. It's everything about the club. Okay, so there's right. lots of pictures, lot lots of names, lots of faces. Uh, lot, not about a lot of outside content. You can get that in a lot of places. So, yeah. but that's a little bit about us. Actually, this is our sort of special edition. Uh, you know, just in terms of letting people know, uh, you know, what's going on with the club and things like that. So, I I really enjoy reading it. So, uh, keep yeah. them coming. <laughs> you, you bet. You bet. In fact, our deadline is a week from Friday. So I'm I'm the editor. So I'm very conscious of it. So. Well, what you're going to have to have to listen to the uh, the next guest. Tim is here, and uh, I was with them on a, uh, a on a Zoom thing last night. I think he said he had like 80 members or 80 people yep. sign in. Yep. So really, any of you that are listening uh, and you want to build your club, there's no reason you can't do it on Zoom. And I know yep. you're I know what you're thinking because there's a lot of bad press about Zoom, but. Uh, the owner, the guy that started the whole thing was on Fox News here recently, and he said the problem we have is people will not put in a solid password. They'll go one, yep. two, three, four, or whatever. But he said our problems happen to be just strong passwords. And so that come from the guy that owns the thing. And I, uh, I hope that we can see more Zoom things happening because it definitely is uh, quite a, a neat way to – to do things here with our uh, communications. Well, Ed, it's been great having you. I, I thank you, and I look forward to coming visiting the club, either Skype or Zoom or whatever, and just having That'd some darn fun. So, um, tell It'd be great everybody. to have you. So, again, th and thanks for the invitation as well. So, 73s. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Well, we, we started this a few weeks ago, and it's really grown. It's to the point that I had to do something to coordinate it with me. I've, I'm getting so many requests, so I have a a, a whole file of, of requests. And then I have what I call my green, green room, <laughs> and that's who's going to be on next week, so uh, who I promised to be on. So uh, our uh, club spotlight, uh, Victor, uh, bring that up again. I, I want everyone to, if you're in a good club and you're trying to have fun and enjoy more activity, let people know about it, all you have to do is send me an email and we will be sure to get your club, uh, as I say, uh, hopefully on up into the green room. And then we'll, uh, we'll be in touch with you because we've got to check the Skype or, and make sure that all works good. But uh, it's really great. And, and I'm so thrilled that uh, so far it's been a very positive thing. So any of you club members, uh, send me a note. Let's see what happens. Just, you can send it to me at ARRL or send it to Ham Clubs with an S. Ham Clubs at twit.tv. And uh, let's get your club on here. Well, we had a good one last night. Man, oh man, oh man, it was a barn burner. 
And here is uh, Tim with us. And uh, Tim is a KB1 POP. And we want to thank you for being on with us, Tim. Uh, we had a good time last night, didn't we? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, Bob, I wanted to uh, uh, start off by saying thank you for having us on. And also uh, thanks to our past president and newsletter editor, Forrest Schick, WA2MZG, uh, for starting this conversation between you and I and getting us connected and uh, ultimately getting Rara on this program. Ra Ra, Rochester Amateur Radio Club, is that right? Or association? Yep. Association, yep. Oh uh, well, I uh, I have great fond memories of the club when Harold Smith was still uh, uh, cooking and in charge. I'm sure, uh, Gordo, you remember? Uh, I re you remember Harold Smith? I bet you. Uh, oh, he was indeed. Yes, I've had the privilege of hearing him talk many years ago, and it was the best. But you know, Bob, the best part of Tim's comment about their big meeting was in-person meetings, what, months before, Tim? A good turnout, 30 to 40. But going to Zoom, you had how many last night? Yeah, 83. Oh, <laughs> so it really points out, uh, turn your club not into meeting canceled, but rather try something new and tell them all they got to do is just click on the invite and uh, they're uh, nearly in. So uh, it gets a lot of hams who may not be up on uh, computers uh, to give it a try and see how easy it is. So go ahead, Tim. How about the success of uh, almost 80 last night, huh? Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a real success for us. We were really surprised um, to see that many people signing on, and uh, we got a lot of positive feedback. Obviously, uh, it was a shift for us. We always do our meetings in person, so it was a first time operation. Uh, but things went really well, and we got more positive feedback uh, from our online meeting than we have from some of our in person meetings. Wow. Congratulations. What do you think about that, Bob? Huh? Oh, That's what you and I have been talking about the last <laughs> last couple of weeks in this uh, club spotlights. Woke up a few of the clubs and boy, Tim, you uh, you bring it right to a head and uh, we're really excited about it. Well, I have a few pictures. Let's uh, let's run through some of these pictures and uh, you can uh, tell us what's going on as we go through them. Tim, go ahead. Sure. Uh, I'll start with a tiny bit of background uh, because I didn't include any photos with this data. Uh, Rochester has a long history of ham radio operation uh, with clubs with documented bylaws back to 1913. Uh, and in 1931, two of those clubs combined to form the Rochester Amateur Radio Association. We currently have in the area 500 members and we have 20 other clubs, about 20 other clubs in the area that we consider to be affiliates. Uh, we share members, we share information. Um, and the other statistic is that our newsletter uh, has a distribution of about 4,700 people. So our oh. editor of our newsletter does a great job. That's also um, Forrest Chick I mentioned earlier who got us in touch. 4,700, that's great. Well, it, uh, well, what's going on here with uh, with these uh, two pictures that are on the screen, please? Sure. Uh, one of the things that we focus on is getting people education and getting people on the air. So these are both pictures of our RARA Academy program. Uh, these are special meetings, usually outside of our standard uh, meeting, which is a weekday. So these would take place on a Saturday, and they're a longer meeting from two to four hours, uh, and they focus on a specific topic. So um, in the top photo, uh, that one was about portable operation and especially focusing on power from solar and different types of batteries and charging. And the lower photo is uh, a class that we taught on soldering. So we've been, we have our regular monthly meeting programs which cover lots of broad topics and I'll talk about that more in a moment but these programs allow us to focus on specific things and you can see um, you know it's a much lower student to teacher ratio in these environments so people can get their questions answered a little bit easier and be more engaged 
Um, our club is successful because of the people. So I just want to thank uh, Tim Brown, who was in the top photo, WB2PAY, and Scott Tice, W2LW, who have put a lot of work into those academy programs. This photo is our annual auction. All of our members bring stuff, and uh, two of our excellent auctioneers who have been doing this for, oh, many, many years, uh, Ed Gable and Dick Gosley, K2MP and KG2I, have uh, been our auctioneers for a long time. This is definitely our busiest meeting of the year. More people show up for this than anything else. And it's always a great opportunity uh, to pick up something new at a great price. I also Gordo, Gordo and I need we need to get on an airplane to come out there, but we can't do that right now. That sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I see is. several. Oh my gosh, even more! But this is the best part: live operation. Go ahead, yeah. Tim. Yeah. So um, we do. Uh, this is especially important to me because I live in a part of town where I have too much interference to really operate HF at home. Um, so we operate. Uh, this is our um, our picnic. So we don't have a formal meeting in uh, June. We have uh, or July. We have a picnic instead. So the photo that's not shown is the people working the grill, and then we get a couple of uh, club and member radios out, and we spend a day in the great weather outside operating. And uh, it's it's a great opportunity for people to get out, and especially for our members that don't have their own equipment or don't have uh, HF equipment to get on the air for the first time. This is another program that's very similar. It's a little hard to see in the left picture, but we have uh, four or five antennas set up outside. Um, and we all know that antennas set up in the worst weather work the best. So we program <laughs> this in February. And uh, it's a bit of a smaller event because it's harder to get people to come out in the cold. But we do a crock pot cook off that gets everybody uh, uh, fat and happy and warm. And then uh, we spend the afternoon operating. <laughs> Great. This is yet another operating opportunity. Uh, this is on International Lighthouse Lightship Weekend. Uh, one of our members, W2DST, Dave Timmons, organizes this. It's a two day event at a lighthouse that's. Um, right near the shores of Lake Ontario. So we string some antennas right up onto the lighthouse and we make contacts with other lighthouses and light ships around the world. Yeah, yeah. It's also it a great it also it also opportunity for us because uh, people visit the lighthouse regularly anyways. So people come by and they ask us what's going on and it gives us an opportunity to introduce ham radio to people that otherwise wouldn't know about it. It also proves that there there are days that there aren't it isn't snowing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, another part of our engagement, uh, you know, in education is we do a lot of work with a bunch of local Boy Scout organizations. My goodness. Um, some of our our members, KC Two EUS and N Two JAC, um, they're both in the lower left photo. Uh, Fox Hunt is always uh, popular. It's a way. You know, I'm not excellent with kids, but these guys are. And uh, doing something to keep them physically busy and engage them in radio works well. Um, one of our members, Steve Fell, K2SRF, was recognized for, um, was either 50 or 60 years of service doing amateur radio yeah. with wow. Scouts operations. My, my, oh my. If we're not getting people on the air, we we do a lot of public service. Um, you can see here, these are a couple events going on. We have Tour de Cure, which is, I think, four to 5,000 cyclists Ooh. on um, five different routes, ranging from uh, about 10 to 100 miles. Um, we believe in, obviously, using radio, but also using other technologies at our disposal at the time. So we're using APRS. Uh, we're using IP-linked repeaters. We're using soft phones so that everybody can, um, different participants can call in via whatever mode they have available. And then our control center can dispatch out support 
to different points on the course. Man, that, that's really super. This looked like a mini Dayton in Rochester. <laughs> we wouldn't be a ham club without a ham fest. Um, <laughs> our ham fest has been going on um, for about 90 years. We've missed a few here and there. Uh, these are a couple samples from the last few years. Um, we love doing this stuff. I, It's a lot of work to put together. I've uh, been on the committee for the last few, but it's always worth it. People have a great time. And we do a lot of other programs other than the swap meet at the Ham Fest. We do license exams. The ARRL is there. We do some remote presentations from um, vendors or designers. Um, we do ARRL awards checking. Uh, there's a lot going on at our Ham Fest. Well, Tim, you guys are very, very active. I love it. And I'm glad you're sharing all of this information with the rest of our clubs here on our club spotlight uh, portion of the show. And we'll have to keep a keep a watch on you guys and see what you're going to do next. But I'm very impressed. And uh, I've, I've known about the club for a long time. Back in the 80s, why, when Harold was uh, really at the helm there, I, I played the Hammond organ. They, had, they hired a, a guy to bring in a Hammond and I played for their banquet one year. So remember all that. It was really great fun. Well, thank you so much for being here. Gordon, do we uh, top this one? I mean, this is pretty hard to top, don't you think, Gordo? Yep, I think so. That's a goodie. Thanks, Tim, and thanks to your club for making Ham Radio happen, Bob. Exactly. 7-3 to you and all Rochester, and uh, let's do it again soon. Okay, Tim, stay in touch. Thanks again. All right. That's the way it should be. So we want all of you to uh, once again uh, uh, send us some notes. Uh, uh, let me know what you, what you need to make it happen because we can help you uh, if you're not familiar with how to get onto Skype and so on. Um, let's, uh, let's get together. Just send me an email, hamclubs at twit.tv. It'll work or my call at ARRL. And we'll like, we'd like to have your club in the spotlight also. Uh, the spotlight now is turning around to Louisiana and South Mississippi, though. I think there's a Don Wilbanks out there. What do you think? Hello, Don. How are you, buddy? Not that guy. He's annoying. <laughs> that Wilbanks guy, he's annoying. I don't, I don't know. There's something wrong with him. I don't want him in the house. Hey, how you doing? Good, good, to, good to see everybody out there today. Uh, of course, we're all in the house. We're all stuck at home. And that means that we have a whole bunch of time for stuff, like honeydew lists. Well, when you finally get that done, it's time to do some work on your station. Yeah, spring has sprung, and you really need to be getting everything together. So, But don't worry, because DX Engineering makes it super easy to order antennas and towers, as well as replacement parts and accessories for your existing tower. Uh, like the American Tower Company, DX Engineering offers American Tower Company galvanized steel sections, bases, brackets, and accessories. The Amorite brand towers work well in self-supporting guide and bracketed installations. DX Engineering also an authorized Roan distributor. That's the first name in towers, right? Roan. That means you get access to the entire Roan line, the 25G, the Legend, the 45G, 55G, the big boy galvanized steel towers, they're all available, plus telescoping masts, base plates, guy wire, hardware, and a lot more. And TBX Towers let you build an affordable freestanding stamped steel tower, perfect for spaces that can't accommodate a guide tower. And DX Engineering offers self-supporting aluminum tower packages from Universal Towers, featuring heavy wall tubing legs and welded S-bracing for years of dependable service. And also the full line of tower accessories, high strength, high insulation filistrand, non-metallic tower guy lines provide significant advantages over steel, including the elimination of electromagnetic and RF interference. And filistrand makes steel big grip dead ends, big grip dead ends. That uh, really eases the completion of any guying installations. Also, choose some DX engineering and filistrand tail kits to protect your non-metallic guy lines, turnbuckles to help build your tensioning system, advanced design thrust bearings, heavy-duty mast, antenna accessories, shelves, and a whole lot more. And the Elmers at DX Engineering want to remind everyone 
in the ham radio community, take every possible safety precaution when climbing your amateur radio towers. It should go without saying, but you know from past history, you have to say it, and you have to be ultra careful up on your tower. And DX Engineering has put together a series of videos covering all aspects of safe tower climbing, from the importance of being properly trained to inspect the tower to make sure it's safe to climb. You'll find all those videos and a whole lot more amateur radio content on the DX Engineering blog on allbands.com. That's on allbands.com. Check the blog throughout April and May for new videos hosted by tower climbing expert Tim Jellison, W3YQ. And DX Engineering ships faster than anybody else in the industry. Most orders placed by 7 p.m. Eastern time are shipped the same day. With proven products and expert advice, DX Engineering is helping you shrink the globe. So request your catalog or shop online 24-7 at dxengineering.com slash hamnation. And, of course, we appreciate DX Engineering for their support of what we do here at Ham Nation. We appreciate Dr. Tamitha Scove, too, because she's got a solar update for us. She's going to talk a little bit about that comet that kind of fizzled. You remember that from a few weeks ago? She's got some information on that by request, I might add. And uh, also, we've got the news of the week from Amateur Radio Newsline. So let's do that now. From Amateur Radio Newsline report number 2216, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, April 22nd, 2020. Our top story is the cancellation of Ham Radio Friedrichshafen. The major global amateur radio event was scheduled for the 26th through the 28th of June in southern Germany. New regulations announced by Chancellor Angela Merkel and Bavaria's President Markus Söder have ended prospects for any large events at least through to the end of August. Newsline will provide more information as it becomes available. Newsline anchor Paul Brown, WD9GCO. As the COVID-19 pandemic persists, more amateur radio events are being affected. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed plans for a drill that was to be held next month by the Military Auxiliary Radio System. Jack Parker, W8ISH, has that report. Ordinarily, hams and members of the military would be getting ready just about now for the Armed Forces Day crossband test, which was scheduled to take place on Saturday, May 9th. Like so many other radio events around the world, however, this exercise conducted by the Military Auxiliary Radio System, or MARS, has been postponed as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Mars interoperability test involves military stations using selected military frequencies to announce what amateur radio frequencies they are monitoring to enable cross-band contacts to be made. Armed Forces Day test planners said the government stations involved in the event may not necessarily be available because of the worldwide crisis. Planners are instead looking at scheduling a similar event in November in conjunction with Veterans Day. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jack Parker, W8ISH. The much-anticipated inaugural Youth on the Air summer camp in IARU Region 2 has also been canceled. The camp was to have been held in the Cincinnati, Ohio area on June 21st through the 26th. Organizers are trying to plan for an online event as an alternative in June, if possible. The camp itself will be postponed until June of 2021. In New York, hams are preparing a statewide thank you to those on the front lines of this unprecedented pandemic. Hams in New York State, which has more COVID-19 patients than any other U.S. state and more cases than any other nation, are giving the world's biggest amateur radio thank you to the men and women on the front lines. The Great South Bay Amateur Radio Club in Lindenhurst, New York, is coordinating the activation of special event station K2H, that's H for heroes, starting May 1st and running through May 31st. This is a statewide activation with hams in every county throughout the state operating in the spirit of gratitude for the police, firefighters, mortuary workers, medical professionals, and food service workers, the people who keep things moving while the world itself seems to have stopped. If you're in New York and wish to join them, please email the organizers at k2hheroes at gmail.com for details. Be listening for K2H on all bands and in all modes. Downloadable certificates will be available, as will big thank yous for everyone. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jim Dameron, N8TMW. And a reminder that the nominating period for the 2020 Bill Pasternak WA6ITF Newsline Young Ham of the Year Award is now open. 
You'll find the form on our website, arnewsline.org, under the awards tab. The award will be presented Saturday, August 22nd at the Huntsville Ham Fest in Alabama. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for four decades and counting at arnewsline.org. With Paul Brown, WD9GCO, Jack Parker, W8ISH, Jim Dameron, NATMW, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the news desk in New York, and our news team across the globe. I'm Don Wellbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. Now, here's the solar update from Dr. Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW. It's been an exciting week in space weather. We're coming down from a solar storm, the likes of which we haven't seen in quite some time. And it brought Aurora as far south as Seattle, Washington in the Northern Hemisphere, and as far north as Christchurch, New Zealand in the south. And just like that, we're now beginning to see some fast solar wind. It's almost as like it's a chaser after a stiff drink because it's brought us back up to active conditions. And we're easily gonna see that over the next couple days. Now, as we switch to our front side sun, you can see that remnant coronal hole that's rotating into the Earth strike zone. That's where that source of fast solar wind is. That's kind of bumping us up to active conditions now. And also on the 19th, we had a little bit of a filament eruption in the south, and it looks like it did launch a very small solar storm. So we may have yet another solar storm that's Earth directed, but it's hard to tell, and it's probably going to be a lot smaller than this one we just had. Switching to our far sided sun, this is stereo A, and it's looking at the sun pretty much from the side. You can see that bright region in stereo's view. And and it's rotating off of the sun's west limb. Now this region is rotating into Earth view and it will take over the next couple days for it to come fully into view, but it should boost the solar flux back into the marginal range for radio propagation on Earth's day side, which is good news because on Earth's night side with these solar storms, I could tell you the GPS reception and radio comms for space traffic probably isn't doing so well. By now you have probably heard about the demise of poor Comet Atlas. About a month ago, Atlas was poised to become the first really bright naked eye comet in a decade. But then Atlas shrugged and now it's falling apart. Best estimates indicate it is fragmented into at least three pieces, none of which will be able to produce the kind of significant display we had all hoped. Atlas's fate might have been predictable considering that soon after its discovery in late 2019, it brightened extremely rapidly. Combined with the fact that it was traveling in the same orbit as the Great Comet of 1844, made many believe that it was a remnant of that famous comet, which meant it could either become spectacular in its own right, or disintegrate right before our eyes. It chose the latter. Indeed, the brightening trend of Atlas flattened on March 17th, and by early April it was fading. Astronomers Yi and Zhang published this paper in the Astronomer's Telegram that showed the comet head, or coma if you prefer, was elongating. In comet speak, this is bad news. Comets don't usually elongate, and when they do, it means its nucleus is beginning to fragment. But even as one comet dies, another comes into view. On April 11th, the same day that Atlas broke into three pieces, Amateur astronomer Michael Mazziazzo discovered a new comet while looking at data from NASA's SOHO spacecraft. The comet suddenly appeared in images from the Solar Wind Anisotropies instrument, also known as SWAN. Now, this instrument was never designed to find comets. Its job is to survey the solar system for hydrogen. But because comets often spray a significant amount of hydrogen into space in the form of water ice, they're often easily detected by SWAN. So, of course, this comet has been appropriately been named SWAN. Currently, Comet SWAN is only accessible to those south of the equator, and it can be seen in the faint constellation of Sculptor. As of April 16th, it was shining at magnitude plus 7.8, easy enough to pick up in good binoculars, and displaying a head roughly one-sixth the apparent width of the moon. So will SWAN become bright enough to be seen with the naked eye? No one's sure yet. Like Atlas, Comet SWAN appears to be relatively small. Assuming it continues to brighten at its current pace, it could reach third magnitude during the final week of May. And that would make it bright enough to be visible to the naked eye just when people in the northern hemisphere could have an opportunity to see it, very low in the west-northwest sky after sunset, and then again low in the east-northeast sky before sunrise. And lucky us, we will have a new moon on May 22nd, which will give us the darkest skies of the month, perfect for viewing. For more details on this week's space weather, including when and where to see Aurora and how radio communications is going to fare, come check out my channel or see me at spaceweatherwoman.com.
What a wealth of information that woman is, huh? Dr. Tamitha Scove. Make sure you follow her on Twitter, at Tamitha Scove. And, of course, check out spaceweatherwoman.com. But Twitter is the best way to, to get a hold of her and to see exactly what she's doing because she literally posts all the time. And just a great asset to our family here at Ham Nation and Amateur Radio Newsline, but not only to us here particularly, just in our little gathering, but just to amateur radio and, and the family just in general. Just so, so proud to have her on our team. Right, Gordon? She's just the best. Gordon was the one, actually, who helped her get her license and helped facilitate that VE session. So, uh, Gordon, thank you for uh, helping her get into the fold. Well, she did all the work, believe me. Thanks so much, Don, and great uh, program tonight. Well, this Saturday, New Zealand is talking all about it. Uh, they call it New Zealand Backyards on the Air. And uh, they'll be on uh, many different frequencies. But here's something that we could do as well, and that is BYOB. Bring your own ballon. And Let's put our own backyards on the air safely, conforming to uh, CDC guidelines of uh, being uh, well-spaced away from everybody else. And uh, let's take a look at backyards on the air. And we encourage all of you to give it a try this coming Saturday. And what the heck, maybe even Sunday as well. <clears throat> Any backyard will work, whether your uh, grass is green or not so green. And the whole idea is to go ahead and uh, get any kind of an antenna. This is one several years ago from Vent Antenna or Ventana. And um, <clears throat> it is uh, helical wound sections that uh, one goes on top of the other in a very special order to give you everything from uh, 10 meters through 75 meters. But you know, you got to have a good ground. <clears throat> so they also supply ground wires. No, uh, no matter what you do to try and get a good earth ground, generally the ground wires will make the unit tune up right on frequency. And they even give you little marks on the wire so you know which band you are uh, setting up. So that's Ventenna. If you ever see one at a swap meet or if uh, they are selling them in your local area, grab one because uh, they're quite a remarkable performer. <clears throat> but read the instructions. So, yep, I know screen to try and make a good uh, ground. Uh, generally for HF antennas, you need a pretty wet ground with a lot of salt in it <clears throat> to get a good uh, ground plane. And essential for your backyards on the air this coming weekend is make sure you've got a good SWR analyzer because you want to take a look and make sure that you're right on the nose. That's Jim in 6J up across the street. He doubles as a volunteer examiner when we have folks like Tamitha and my wife Susie. Um, we uh, three got her um, uh, all licensed up through the W5YI system that now does remote exams. But he, too, has a very interesting backyard antenna. <clears throat> he says he may even put it up in the front yard to talk ham radio at a distance to those interested in what it's all about. Now, it's the telescopic stainless steel whip from MFJ. That loading coil is tapped for the proper band. Uh, he has some non-conducting uh, line for uh, stability. And he's on the air. He looks at the SWR meter. <clears throat> and this thing really talks. And he made a lot of great contacts from his front yard. But it would work probably just as well <clears throat> as his backyard. Yeah, you could use an antenna tuner, but you know, quite frankly, I like to get the antenna tuned and have the joy of operating a rig. This one doesn't have any built-in tuner uh, without a tuner, but uh, uh, in this case, a ladder line to keep uh, the uh, losses low is another good way to get an antenna up and playing. <clears throat> Well, BYOB, bring your own battery. Uh, certainly wind power is good, but most of us get on the air in the morning hours and there's not much wind. And BioNO, the manufacturers of the lithium iron phosphate cells, that one you see in the background with the clip leads on it, that ran me a full weekend at field day and it had uh, power to spare thanks to BioNO power as well as their folding solar panels. And now they have some new solar 
panels that are flexible. You can walk on them, step on them, and uh, they continue to put out uh, anywhere from four or five amps in the direct sunlight. I always like to see what my rig is doing when it comes to working off of a battery. HamSource, an East Coast supplier of great equipment, and my trusty ICOM 706 Mark IIG <clears throat> gives me a look at uh, how everything's going. And right now, it shows I'm probably not on a, well, I can see it in the background. I'm not on a bio -inno power, but a regular um, <clears throat> uh, gelled battery. 12.0, two volts. That's a little low for HF operation. Now, you can go out and buy your own <clears throat> dipole, your off-center fed dipole. But hey, for this backyard uh, get-together this weekend, Make your own when your wife is not looking, guys, or ladies, when the OM is outside. Uh, grab an extension cord. Make absolutely sure it's not plugged in. <clears throat> and uh, cut, uh, cut the extension cord, making sure it's not accidentally plugged in. <clears throat> and uh, then strip that wire apart, and you'll have equal lengths for a half-wave dipole. And I always recommend uh, do your own ballot. Remember, it's BYOB this weekend on Saturday and maybe even Sunday. Uh, bring your own ballot. Well, what the heck? Make your own ballot as we're doing here. <clears throat> and most important, get it up a little bit in the air. You can see it behind me and uh, get on the air. That's the big thing. You don't need one or more people. You need just you to get uh, started. And there's that same dipole uh, working uh, field day with uh, great success. And again, you can't have enough of the little ferrite um, uh, elimination of RF coming down the outside braid of the coax. So these ferrites <clears throat> will keep the RF up in the antenna and hopefully none coming back down to bite you. Uh, DX Engineering has this antenna from Transworld. Uh, it's a remarkable antenna, does not need any further grounding in that the uh, ground radial is the bottom one. The upper is the radiation uh, portion, and the center are matching coils <clears throat> that snap into place depending as to which band you're on. But there's some backyard operation. Above all, be cautious. Watch the fumes of a generator and uh, watch the regulations of a generator. Generators are good, but, you know, you're only going to operate a few hours. I don't know if you want to uh, do the old generator routine. And make sure that where you set up, it's okay to be on the beach or wherever. Here in Southern California, uh, we got away with a little beach operation. Uh, this was an official-looking official, and he wanted to know what this is all about. And by the way, his call sign was Kilo Charlie. <laughs> I didn't realize he was one of my past students till he gave me the grill. <clears throat> um, this is um, the chameleon uh, man, Carl Lavoie. And uh, Carl says uh, it doesn't take much to get on the air. He strung this out in our backyard. And the first station he worked was Hawaii. Um, he makes the great loops, and he's supported by John Miller uh, in the 7 JDM, and um, they, um, uh, they make sure that all of these antennas are uh, ready to roll. There's the tuning unit on the bottom. It doesn't have to be elevated a whole bunch, <clears throat> and we tried the uh, solar radiator, the one on the right, versus the coax radiator, the one on the left, and they were almost similar. But when it came to uh, getting everything in uh, the dune buggy and other vehicles on the way home or the way out to another uh, backyard, uh, we found out that, of course, the coax one uh, stows a lot more easily than the hard one. Uh, Jim says, hey, why buy one? Make one. So there's Jim again, N6JF, and he's got the tuning capacitor and even a fixed capacitor way up at the top of his loop. And his homebrew loop did a fantastic job. And uh, just be sure and don't overrun power. Now, we're going to convince you, Don, that uh, you need a good HF uh, whip on all of the vehicles you have. And uh, I think Don has got a spot for this big HF antenna on the rear. But uh, if you don't have room... <clears throat> Uh, for this weekend's operation, uh, you can just pull over in front of your front yard and set up your own HF antenna. Or if you've got a really monster HF antenna, I love his tuned grounds. And, you know, I looked at this and I go, oh, my God. 
And he says, watch this. And he like loaded up and talked immediately to the East Coast Plus, uh, one European station on 20 uh, at the bottom of our solar cycle. So I was impressed by both its look, <laughs> the amazing thing that how well it performed. So you never know. No, you don't need to put up a big three element beam on the back of your RV. You're not going to go anywhere <clears throat> with that up in the air. So we encourage you to think about uh, what's a good antenna to get on the air this uh, weekend. <clears throat> well, up at 10,000 megahertz, there you want to have a clear shot. Not necessarily. In fact, the San Bernardino Microwave Society uh, made a test this past uh, week. And from our home, listen to this contact using that same exact dish. Uh, this is on 10,000 megahertz, and we're going over a 5,000-foot peak. Uh, this is called Knife Edge Defraction. <laughs> He, he sounded excited, didn't he? Well, he was surprised that even a 5,000-foot hill and separated by more than 50 miles, we could still make contact. He was running about 30 watts. I had maybe uh, 2 watts, but we got the job done, as you can hear there. <clears throat> And, uh, of course, that's Don Arnold, W6 GPS. Uh, Donnie always likes to mess with people. So uh, we were doing some uh, uh, mountain topping, getting ready for this weekend. And, uh, indeed, people slowed down as they uh, approached our operating uh, station. So always a little bit of fun when you're uh, playing uh, uh, radios and antennas. Bicycle Mobile, you ought to try it this weekend. Uh, bring along your HF and uh, get it on the bicycle, as we saw last week, or even just your portable, and uh, safely uh, stay six feet away, wear protective masks and so on, and uh, he's ready to roll. And <clears throat> this is my favorite. I always like to go swimming, but when you're up in the uh, mountains uh, near um, <clears throat> uh, Mammoth and so on, it uh, gets mighty cold up there. This water is 104 degrees coming right out of the mountain. And it's near Bishop, and um, it is uh, the warmest hot springs. And I always enjoy doing a little operating from 105-degree water. So no matter where you are this weekend, make sure that you're separated from everybody else. Uh, bring along your little go-pack bag full of radio gear set up in your backyard. And uh, this is uh, Carl's setup and a little vertical antenna, one of the chameleon, and uh, they're available through many different sources, including DX Engineering. And the amateur television folks, um, they are constantly branching out, and their amateur television network uh, is uh, one of the most popular uh, throughout the country because they are linking more and more amateur television network enthusiast hams together. So we plan to do a little bit of ATV as well this coming Saturday at Bring Your Own um, uh, Ballon. <clears throat> and uh, Dave and Tina, uh, uh, longtime uh, amateur radio examiners, and they've helped me out from Alaska all the way to uh, the uh, San Diego area. They have their own uh, grab-and-go pack, and as you can see, it's well outfitted. That's Tracy with the Mountaintop Amateur Radio Association. He's got a nice setup for a backyard setup. There's mine, and we're ready for a backyard weekend on ham radio. So, no matter where you go, make sure that this coming Saturday and Sunday, we can be like the New Zealanders and uh, operate a little backyard ham radio because that's what makes ham radio fun. And if you operate in the front yard, you got to put your mask and all your protective gear on. But it's a great way to tell your neighbors, what are all those antennas? And then you'll have a chance beyond six feet to explain it to them. Not as a group, though. Stay, uh, stay safe. So we hope everybody has an exciting weekend this weekend, and I hope to work you from BYOB, my backyard on a ballon, and hopefully some wires on each end of that ballon. Well, I'll have my ICOM 706, but you know there's more modern radios. So let's take a look and see what ICOM America has in store for us. Get out and be active with ICOM's new IC705 and its optional multifunction backpack. 
The IC705 is your perfect QRP companion as you have base station features and functionality at the tips of your fingers in a portable package covering HF 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs in at 1 kilo or just over 2 pounds with RF direct sampling for most of the HF band and IF sampling for frequencies above 25 megahertz. 5 watt battery operation with BP272 or 10 watts with a 13.8 volt DC supply. Modes include single sideband, CW, AM, FM, as well as full D-Star functions. A large 4.3 inch color touchscreen and live band scope with waterfall. Integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger. Micro SD card for data storage. It comes standard with the HM243 speaker microphone, and it supports QRP and QRPP operations. The perfect accessory for the IC705 is the LC192 optional backpack with a special compartment for your IC705 and room for accessories for soda activations or just a day in the park. Visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information about this and all the great ICOM radios. Pretty slick little bit of kit right there, huh? You can also enter ICOM's weekly drawing for ICOM swag, like T-shirts and hats, and don't forget to check out the details for ICOM's monthly grand prize drawing. Win yourself a radio. Go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation for official rules and to check out all of ICOM's previous drawing winners. Your name could uh, very well be on that list very soon. Sign up and good luck. All right, George is out tonight, and uh, Bob has commandeered the soldering iron, so let's see what's going on with Smoke and Solder, the Heil edition. <laughs> okay, Don, good to see you, buddy. And I, <clears throat> I, Well, I won't do any soldering, but I just want to remind you what's going on in the back of this uh, feeble little brain here. Uh, I talked about it, uh, uh, was it last week or week before? I, I, we're going to build an amplifier for the pine board. And I've been picking up parts. I did a power supply. Uh, this is about uh, 400 volts. And um, I uh, I think we might want to do something a little, little more because I want to be able to get about 50 watts out of this. Now, this amplifier, a lot of you will be able to use it with your QRP rigs to drive it. There'll be a lot of other things than just a pine board. So... Uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna up uh, up the ante a little bit. First of all, <clears throat> you, you hear me talk about this a lot. This is my Harvey Wells. I've had it since 1956. I still use it daily. It's a great rig, and uh, this is the tube that it uses. It's an 807. Uh, I was going to do a 6146. I really like 6146s, but we have to neutralize them, and that's a little tricky. So I'm going to uh, do the old 807, but we're going to have to have a very healthy transformer because this power supply is going to run about seven to 800 volts, and we're going to have to have a lot of schooling about respecting. We do anyway, but we've got to respect that high voltage. And the caps, I've, and see, I have a lot of this stuff. My, here, here, here's what you call just a, a, just a piece of a junk box. <laughs> all kinds of stuff in here. Look at all that stuff in there. But it's not junk because uh, I'm going to need a meter. So I have a meter. And I'm going to need a coil, and I have coils. I need a variable tuning and uh, I have all kinds of tuning. But I really need to have, like, RF chokes with a plate cap. Uh, and you know what you really need? A socket. Well, you are not going to buy these things uh, at Lowe's. So, hey, Mr. Brainiac, not everybody has this. This is um, 60 years. <laughs> I was a room full back there with more. Uh, I don't throw any of that away. I have to explain to Sarah once in a while how important it is to save things. I mean, this is, gosh, probably 40, 50 years old. And this socket's probably the better, but you need a socket. And, and so I have one, okay? What happens when you don't have it? 
and you're going to say, well, he's crazy. And I'll get emails. Go ahead and flame me. I'll get email. What are you trying to do that for? You can't. Oh, yes, you can. We will go to antique electronic supply, just like we did with the pine board. And they'll have a parts list. They'll have a kit for it, just like they did with the pine board. They had a power supply pine board. They had a pine board equalizer, a mic preamp, and they had the my, the five watt final had all the parts had a couple you couldn't get uh, if you remember we uh, uh, where's my other little box here this, this was cool do you remember I told you I told you in the beginning that you needed to uh, uh, buy some of those eggs remember <laughs> whatever it makes a great thing when you're building to uh, classify all your parts with the uh, diagram and you'll have them all there but one of the biggest problems is shortly after i started building that with you they quit making this part the most valuable part of any transmitter and you couldn't get them it's like okay now you what do you do now mr smart brains you go to the master m f J. And what, not only that, but you're going to say, well, Heil, I don't have all those coils, MFJ. And so we, ha we will have all the parts. We will tell you where you can get all the parts because uh, Antique Electronic Supply will not have all of them. But I will guarantee you that before I get – that's what I'm doing now is getting everything together. Gene, remember Gene, WD4IQN, with those incredible diagrams he does. He will have diagrams just like that. It will be fun. Uh, we'll have to be very careful. Uh, I have the capacitors. I have 500-volt five capacitors. Um, <laughs> what's going to happen – uh, when you plug a 500 volt capacitor onto a 700 volt, uh, it's going to be July the 4th, right? No, it's not. By the way, notice what I do with all my capacitors. I short the leads together. Why do I do that? <laughs> I do that so I don't get zapped because they can still have a charge in them. So I, I do that with all my spare ones. But here's the deal. If you take a pair, uh, now listen up, listen up. I got to have the plus here and the plus here and the minus goes there. If you take two capacitors and hook them in series, you have a thousand volt capacitor. Instead of buying a thousand volt capacitor, you better rob your wife's piggy bank on this one because it's expensive. Of these, nah, a couple bucks, and uh, series them. And we got to put, we said, we're going to teach you how to do that. And these are the things that I love about building this stuff with you because, yeah, we're going to build an amplifier, but you're going to learn some things, little small things, but they'll be important. So, not going to happen tomorrow, but. It, it'll be coming along. I'll give you little updates once in a while. But I've had a few people, hey, when are you going to show it next week? <laughs> no. In fact, that won't be the power supply. I, I built that and it works great, but it's only 400 volts. And I've been been talking to my wonderful mentor, my Harvey Wells expert, W4FTY. Wayne is an 807 expert, and, and he agrees the 807 is going to be the, the tube for you, but we got to get a little more than a couple hundred volts on it, so we'll fix that up. So that's what you have, and uh, we'll have the old smoke and solder going here in a few months, but uh, you happen to see any parts? do it because here's a, another one I should tell you about where did I get all this cool wire came out of old computers so don't throw anything away yeah I might not ever use that plug but I sure will use all the wire you want to collect that put it in your junk box so there you go from the old smoke and solder and uh, well, George will be back next week and We'll continue having fun, but in the meantime, stay, really stay safe. Keep those masks going. Uh, I, you know, we put that rope up yesterday, and both uh, Mike and I had masks, and uh, we 
try to stay six feet or more apart, which we did. So be safe. We don't want to lose anybody in this audience. And please tell everybody that has a ham radio license, they need to be listening. And I will tell you one more thing. Next week, I don't care what you're doing. You have to be here. We're not going to have one. We're going to have two doctors. Uh, one of them is a heart surgeon and the other one works at Mayo. There are going to be two of them. And probably the entire show is going to be your safety. So you might even want to get, gather your family around. This is going to be a, a question and an answer thing. Amanda's going to come on at the first of the show, and we're going to have some incredible things happening. And I want you to be here because you are going to answer the, ask the questions, and those doctors are going to answer them. Something that you'd probably want to want to do, but your doctor's not there. Well, we're going to have them here. And they're both hams, by the way. Valerie, how are you doing? Are you and Jerry staying safe and all that good stuff during this craziness? We are, yep. Day 55 for us. We actually ventured out of off the farm for the first time Sunday. It was so beautiful out. We wanted to make sure the car still worked. So we got in the car and drove to our favorite restaurant and they have curbside pickup and uh, we left cash in the back hatch, and <laughs> she just came out, grabbed the cash, and left some dinner and wine there. It was kind of nice to get out of the house. But that's kind of what I'm going to focus on tonight because, you know, some of you may have only been in lockdown two or three weeks, but I know the longer you are, it's so easy to get cabin fever and um, with all this craziness. Um, so we're going to kind of focus on things to avoid that. But, um, Who's ready to go back to a time when things were much simpler? I know I am. So I'm going to kind of focus on different ways you can kind of keep your sanity in the middle of all this madness. So if you want to start with slide one, Victor, um, there's different ways uh, that you want to keep get going. Uh, keeping busy, staying connected, um, and you need to do things that help reduce your stress and help others in need. And I'm going to tell you from personal experience, helping others in need is going to conquer all four of those things on your list. So if you want to go to the next slide, um, there's ways to volunteer um, even from your armchair at home. You know, Red Cross has virtual positions. Um, so you can just go to redcross.org slash volunteer, become a volunteer and apply now in the volunteer from home section. And you just want to put in your search bar NHQ, I, I, I think it means no headquarters. I'm not sure what that stands for. And virtual or virtual in your search. And, and it'll bring up uh, ways you can volunteer for the Red Cross from home. Uh, I know one thing is like scheduling uh, blood donations and plasma donations and things like that. So uh, next slide. Um, the micromentor.org, they're looking for people to mentor entrepreneurs. Now, with small businesses getting hit so hard, they're going to need our help. And hopefully all of you guys are going to go out and patronize all the small businesses you can. Um, but another way, if, if you had a successful business, you're retired now and you're sitting at home, you know, looking for something to fill your time, help these guys out. Um, you can go on there. They also have a section if you want to help out students, uh, newly graduating students or parolees as well. Next slide. Um, ways to help vets during the thing. You can do, go to hireheroesusa.org. You can help uh, with just mock interviews, um, career counseling, a lot of things you can do from home while you're stuck at home. If, and, and this is really good for your soul. It's good for your head, your mental you know, wellness. Um, and it's a way to give back. So next one, Meals on Wheels. They're, they really uh, shown a surge right now. So they need people to deliver meals. You can do it safely um, where you leave it on their front porch and you're not, you don't have to interact if you don't want to. There's ways to do that. Or they could use your donation. Also, if you just put in Google uh, food pantry in my area, um, it'll come up with a bunch of food pantries. I know food pantries are hurting as well. So please help them out if you can. Uh, during this time. Next slide. If you're handy, you can make masks and shields. Now, I know Michaels has patterns on their website, and I know they were donating about a million dollars worth of fabric 
Um, so you could make masks uh, for the million mask uh, an, uh, initiative they were trying to, everybody was trying to do. So uh, I'm not sure if there's still money left or fabric left or not, but if you go to michaels.com, you can pull off the uh, patterns for free. You can order online, have it shipped to you and, and, and see if they still have the free fabric that you might be able to score some free fabric to make uh, masks and uh, donate to uh, any facilities. Next one. And uh, obviously Red Cross. Um, you can go to redcross.org or redcrossblood.org and you can donate blood. They are really short on blood because usually they get most of their blood from blood drives at local businesses and with businesses closed, uh, they're really on short supply of blood. Um, they're also really looking for people to donate convalescent plasma and that is for people who are recovered from having the COVID-19 uh, virus, which leads me to my guest, Andy, my evil brother, who, not really my brother, but that's who we call Andy. Yeah, just go there. We'll go into that in a bit. Um, so hopefully we got Andy on the line with us, right? Uh, w A A zero W X. Hey, Andy. How are you tonight, Val? I'm doing good. I just want to thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know, Andy is donating convalescent plasma. So, Andy, why don't you kind of tell us about what's all involved uh, to become a donor? Well, becoming a donor, first of all, you've got to be positively identified as uh, having COVID. All right. You go through that uh, routine. Uh, once they double check that and then you go back in about two to three weeks and they see how you're progressing, if antigens are being built up and if you're clear. And then another week later, uh, if you're still clear and the antigens are a little bit higher antibodies, uh, they'll talk to you about uh, donating blood, whole blood, of course, uh, and they'll extract the plasma out of it. If you're being, uh, saying that you're going to have uh, donate to convalescent plasma, they take the whole blood out, separate certain components out of it and the red blood cells and just leave the plasma and they return the red blood cells in another garden nose to the other arm you know and the components to it but uh i'm on my third uh third trial now with it uh going through that and it's showing some promise out there uh, for those that uh uh are really susceptible to it in showing uh showing that they need the help for it uh, so it's it's lessening the injury to them and the mental injury to them uh, with trying to cope with the, the virus that's uh, disabling them right now. It gives them a chance to succeed. Yeah, some of the results, I've been seeing some different studies. I don't know if they're all peer-reviewed or not, but they have looked pretty promising with the conv convalescent plasma. So now when you go in to donate it, so you got the one needle in the arm, taking the blood out, pulling out what it needs, and then putting the the depleted blood back in your system, right, basically. How long does that all take from beginning to end when you go in? Uh, it can take uh, two to three hours. It, it runs me about two, two and a half hours. You know, it just it depends on a lot of things, how well your blood is and how, what your blood pressure is and how, how well you regulate the change. Now, how often can you donate? I, I'm blessed. I can go in about every week and, and give a little bit. Or I can stretch it out and give more if I space it to two weeks. Now, I understand some of your blood also went to... CDC, John Hopkins, Duke, is there, so they're using it for research as well. That's correct. Uh, what happened was, uh, as most people know, I'm under VA Care Veterans Administration, and every time you go in there, of course, they're drawing blood out of me like uh, they're vampires and things. So, But they draw quite a bit of blood out of me, and on the wayside, they checked it since the virus started kicking in, and that's where the initial call came from that uh, they wanted to get me checked on that to, uh, to see how I'm progressing with that. I didn't even know. I had a stuffy nose and that was it. And I found out I had a very robust immune system. So that that's what kicked it for me. And then uh, from there on out, it was pure recovery. It was like a minor cold to me, but other people are devastated with it. Well, that's good. I know, I know you... Um you always volunteer. You always find a land in these volunteer positions when uh, things are needed critically. And so um, we really want to thank you. So basically, if you've had COVID-19, tested positive, gone 14 days without a symptom, tested again and tested negative, weigh at least 100 and so many pounds and, oh, two, two negatives. I mean, you have to have two negatives. 
then you can, and you weigh so much and, you know, you're healthy, then you can donate blood. And obviously, if they want to learn more, there's a whole questionnaire thing they have on uh, right there. If you go to uh, uh, redcrossblood.org. And uh, thanks again, Andy. Thank you for donating. Thank you for all you do. You make ham radio uh, proud. And also, I want to do a shout out also to Tom Lufkin. I saw him on Facebook, uh, Whiskey Ford Delta Alpha, Alpha X-Ray. He's also doing the same thing, donating his uh, convalescent his blood for convalescent plasma. So um, Ham's doing what it what we do best, right? Giving back and uh, helping out, and uh, really appreciate it, Andy. And I guess we'll I have you on the next time. Of- next time you donate for something, right? Yeah, I think there's a lot of us out there. I think I really think there are a lot of us out there, and uh, I think a lot of them step forward. And sometimes they they're pretty quiet guys. You know, I don't think they really, and women, they, they step forward, do something, and then they just sort of disappear like these people that live in Illinois and sort of just go to restaurants once in a while. <laughs> hey, that was a brave move for me. Oh, so, all right, well, hopefully we'll have you on again soon for something uh, that you're doing that's uh, wonderful again. Thanks again. Well, the hurricane season's coming. You know how we do those yeah, things. Don't say that. Uh, hopefully it's weak. All right. Take care. Um, Also, I just want to mention this weekend, if you're looking for something to do, Florida CUSO party. uh, That's a big one. Uh, It's probably the second or, you know, up there, top three. Uh, I know California is real big. Um, They usually, last two years, they've had over a thousand participants, thousand logs. Um, And that starts Saturday at noon Eastern and runs through Sunday. And um, they have extra categories to no mobile because of the stay at home order. So there's no mobile uh, category, but they have their normal single op, multi op, or like we live in the same household, so we can do multi op. But um, um, they also have other categories that overlays like YL only. I actually sponsor the plaque for the best Florida YL. So uh, if you're in Florida, get on the air and you might win a plaque. Um, under 25, a new one this year, and they also have the rookie category. So, and a school cl- school category. So, have get on the air, have some fun. Uh, you should be busy. It's a nice big contest. So, that's all I've got. So, I'm gonna head it back to Don. Yeah, good stuff, Andy. That's great. And listen, if it's all the same to you, Andy, after the first few months that we've had, those of us living along the Gulf Coast, we just as soon take a pass on hurricane season this year if it's okay with you and and mother nature up there <sighs> can't even think about thinking about that but what i can think about is fresh books and this episode of ham nation is brought to you by fresh books if you're struggling to choose the right accounting software for your business just let fresh books help you FreshBooks is the number one accounting software in the cloud for self-employed professionals and their teams and you can try it free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash ham nation just great stuff with everything that's going on in the world freshbooks wants you to know you're not alone isolation is something that many small business owners feel in general and with today's situation it's even more apparent let freshbooks help you work from home uh, or make the transition be smoother download their app today with the freshbooks app you can keep tabs on your business from anywhere at any time create client profiles enable automation for recurring invoices uh, it's kind of cool to sit back and watch as FreshBooks automatically combines expenses, billable time, and other items into invoices to send to clients on your behalf and use their accounting and reporting tools to file your taxes or evaluate your financials. Let FreshBooks help you through this tough time. 24 million people have used FreshBooks, and it has 4.5 out of 5 stars on Get App. That's a good score. FreshBooks helps you focus on your craft by saving you time invoicing, expensing, and tracking your work, and they've saved users almost 200 hours a year. Great stuff. So, stop chasing after money that your clients owe you. Enable online payments to make it easier for them to pay you, credit cards and ACH uh, in the U.S. Get paid uh, two times faster. You'll receive notifications when clients open your invoices and FreshBooks will automatically send late payment reminders and bill late fees, too. They make it so easy. They also have an award-winning support team that's dedicated to helping you when you need it. And whether you're a freelance photographer, a carpenter, a podcaster, or some guy that makes radio commercials like me, 
You can choose a plan that is just right for you. Visit freshbooks.com slash ham nation. Enter ham nation in the how did you hear about us section. You'll get 30 days free. That's freshbooks.com slash ham nation. Enter ham nation to receive 30 days for free. And for a limited time, FreshBooks is offering 50% off your first three months when you sign up for a paid plan. For new customers only, and offers cannot be combined. Thank you, FreshBooks. We appreciate your help of what we do here at Ham Nation. And we also appreciate the queen of the chat room. That's uh, Miss Amanda. <laughs> well, hello. How's everyone doing tonight? <laughs> uh, Don, did you avoid all those uh, tornadoes and yes, storms? Thankfully, we had okay. one. We had we had well, the one that was up uh, near um, oh it was it was about fifty or sixty miles to the north of us but we had one spin up like all it, it actually the the, uh, the the tornado warning began I looked on the on the radar map right at our house the tornado warning began at our house so it spun up right over us and it, it was uh, radar located after about ten miles away from us and then about twenty miles away from us it fizzled out so. That was the closest that it came to us, but it really it wasn't a bad night the other night for us anyway. It was bad for for other people up around Hattiesburg, but for us it wasn't too bad. So now we did fine. That's good. I mean, that's that's way closer. That's close enough. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, uh, Valerie. This is a serious question because all of uh, I shouldn't say all of us. A lot of us are just throwing up wires and have been on the radio, especially during whatever you want to call it, quarantine, lockdown, stay at home, stay safer. I know there's so many terms. So a lot of people have been getting on the air lately to hear nothing but dismalness on the bands. So they wanted your expert opinion because you guys have an antenna farm, right? So you have a little bit more advantage. They want to know, are you hearing the same stuff? Like it's just been bad. Well, we had that CME the other night, and there's been a lot of storms. There's a lot of static crashes out there. I get on a 40-meter net every night when I can, usually a 0200. Um, and some days it's great. Some days not so good. But, um, you know, any pretty much any time of the day, any day, if we want to get on the radio, we can. But, I mean, we have, you know, six through 160, you know, antennas. And receiving and an, you know list receiving antennas and you know so yeah there is an advantage to being on the antenna farm but a lot of times people don't think bands are open I notice this in contests all the time you don't think something's open and I'll get on ten and I'll just throw out my call sign and people will come back and so you know don't assume if you don't hear something out there that it's not open it just means uh, you're going to be the first one to make the call and get the cue. There you go. I, uh, I've I've joined in on some 20 meter nets lately. You know, middle of the afternoon, and boy, some stations I have heard over Christmas were booming in here. Are but maybe I could hear them, and it's a, a lot more fading in and out. Um, I know it's just it's tough times, and th it's also the season of change, is it not? So we're going through the transition of 40s not so great and 20s getting a little bit better and then um you know we're going to say goodbye to 80 and 160 here pretty soon so it is also that season where we should expect some of those changes to happen don't you think yeah um but take advantage of all the bands you can while you can and 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 there's so many people out there running that's my friend uh retired New York police uh, officer who was in uh, the, tri the Twin Towers on 9-11, um, NY4PD, he's in Florida, and he runs a let net on 40 meters late at night. For those of you out there who can't sleep, um, you know, it's really important we all stay connected and get on the air and talk to people. And so you got to just get out there and uh, you'll be surprised what you hear. Absolutely. And I think someone's always going to answer your call, I'm pretty sure. Or you're going to hear somebody else out there. Us that have the waterfalls, uh, we can look a little bit more and um, see those kind of things. But just just try it. If And if Bob was on right now, he would say, just throw, throw up a wire and see what you can do with it. I um, have a story about that. <laughs> oh, Bob is here. <laughs> okay, don't, great. <laughs> I don't have my antennas all together here yet. Uh, we threw up a rope yesterday. I think I told you earlier. Anyway, we'll have them. I uh, I threw up a 20 meter antenna. I, I, I should have bring it in. Show you them. It was speaker wire. I just wanted to really listen. And it's up about maybe 20 feet out here on the west side. And it's getting all kinds of noises. But I can listen. I worked a couple of guys on it just to see. I'm listening around last Monday, and uh, 
It was a pretty good signal from New York. So I called him and he came back and I'm going, whoa, okay, cool. So I'm going to listen around a little. I go up on 17 meters. Now I understand this thing is cut for, for 20 meters. Up on, I dialed up in about 157.5. I hear a pretty good strong signal. I'm going, whoa, 17 open? I didn't know where the MUF was. Maximum usual frequent, usable frequency. You guys know about that? You see, the bands do do that. There are maximum usable frequencies. So I, I listened to this guy a little bit. He's the only thing on the band. And it was Bud, W3FF. You know who Bud is? How about a Buddy Pole? It's him. And he's on his bicycle. Well, he was on here last week with us. And every day I've checked in with those guys. The first day on my 20 meter antenna, but I went out the next day, I cut it, I cut it for, for 17. And I'm having all kinds of fun on 17 meters with that wire. But uh, we'll have other things. So you see, don't worry about it. I give out a call and you just don't know what's going to happen. So there's my story, Amanda. Oh, okay, well, let's keep talking wires here, Bob. So uh, Kevin, ZM1KFM wanted to know, um, Gordo had mentioned about folding back wire and wrapping it on an antenna to shorten it without cutting it. And he wants to know, is that suitable just for bare wire or is that okay for insulated wire as well? Oh, no, 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 it's for everything. Uh, it, because w what you're looking for, at the length, the length of the wire, and if it's too long, in other words, you're way down in frequency and you need to shorten it. Oh, for goodness sake, don't cut it off. Measure it and take that wire and fold it back so that the right at the fold, that's what you need to have. You can just wrap it and wrap it with tape, whatever. Of course, you'll have your insulator out here, but it's the length of the antenna. And when you fold that back, that doesn't count because it's part of the antenna, absolutely. And it doesn't make any difference what kind of wire. It can be soft, it can be hard, it can be stranded, it can be solid. Wire is wire, I have speaker wire out. And like Gordon showed you tonight, take an, an extension cord, it's a great antenna. And uh, those kind of things work really good. So do it, you will be probably shocked because it'll work pretty good. Well, thanks, Bob. I appreciate that. And so does everyone on the chat room. Uh, we use a lot of uh, electric fence wire here. Now, my last question was about phone patches into repeater systems. And Kevin, again, wanted to know if U.S. repeater systems still use phone patches or if they're still needed. So real fast, uh, let me explain what phone patches are. This is where you can... Uh, get into any repeater if they had that available and you use your DTMF codes and you could actually get a, a, a dial tone. So maybe you could call home or you could call for help. You could actually put in a phone number and uh, go over the repeater and dial a landline. So yes, um, a lot of repeater systems probably don't use them anymore, but I'll tell you what, they're probably very still very important here in uh, mountain states or in very remote places. So, yep, they're still in use. So everyone uh, always uh, look up uh, your repeaters in the area and they, they're gonna have that information and what codes you would need to uh, dial into that. So, all right, one more thing here. We're gonna go over the nets for this evening. Uh, 40 meters a no-go tonight, Kevin. KC7 um, FPF said, eh, I can't hear anything. Well, you guys, maybe just join up on 7192 and see if you can hear each other just like we were just talking about. And 20 meters by uh, W7UDI. Steve's going to be hosting that on 14268. And then we have D-Star on 14 Charlie and DMR on 31012. So hopefully you guys find a place to join in and meet up and uh, talk about the show this evening. Bob, back to you. Okay, thank you very much. What a wonderful show. And they just keep getting better. And um, if, uh, if you're in a club... Please contact us. Club Spotlight is really catching fire and we want you to be a part of it. Just send me an email. You, uh, easy to find it. Find uh, my email address, but here it is on the screen. You can do hamclubs 
at twit.tv or just my call at ARRL. Let me know what you got. I'll send you back a date. I'll put you in the green room <laughs> and get you all set so we know what's going to happen. All you need is Skype and away you go. And if you have a club, you want me to come and do something, I will. I can spend an hour, two hours, three hours, whatever you want on Zoom or Skype and have programs, programs, something to do other than sit around and look at the wall. And now the clubs can use Zoom and have like Tim, he had 80, 80 people in his uh, uh, club meeting the, uh, last night. It was really great. You do that too with your club. Don't sit around and worry about, oh, what are we going to do? There's a lot to do. So thanks, everybody. Wear your mask. Be safe. And the main thing is that we want to we want to have all of you around. So we'll talk to you next week. It's going to be a biggie because the doctors are going to be here. So uh, bring your pencils. Uh, probably be best to record it because there's going to be some great information. So we'll see you next week right here on Ham Nation. Thanks a lot for being here. And 7-3 for now. This is Bob Heil, K9EID in Belleville, Illinois.